Welkom bij De Nieuwe Wereld, verdiepende gesprekken in een tijd van verandering. Mijn naam is Marta van Rijn en vandaag is bij mij te gast Ulrich Scharf. Ulrich is directeur en medeoprichter van Skill Lab. En we gaan dit gesprek beide hebben in het Engels. Want Ulrich is Duits en mijn Duits is niet zo heel erg goed. <laughs> en uh, zijn, uh, uh, nou ja, Nederlands gaan we de komende tijd aan werken, heb ik net gehoord. Dus voor ons nog eventjes in het Engels. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're so welcome, Ulrich. So what we're going to talk about today is mm. people's career path, so to say, and how we move to career paths and how we get support uh, moving in the right direction. Yeah. And uh, when thinking about this, I was actually wondering, like the whole job market, the labor market has been changing so much mm -hmm. the last couple of decades. What was your first job? And how did you get there? My first <laughs> job was really interesting. I, uh, I was terrible at school and I uh, thought if I just continue with school and basically go on to a university after my high school degree, this is going to end in a total disaster. And uh, so I decided to take an apprenticeship. That's really a model that's quite common in Germany. But I unfortunately also didn't have any idea of what kind of apprenticeship I could take or what I <laughs> want to do with my life. And so um, for the lack of ideas and alternatives, I, I started doing a bank apprenticeship um, at a, a German bank. Quickly figured out that I really don't want to work in the financial industry and I didn't quite know how I got to that point. But nevertheless, it was, I think for me, the best thing that could have ever happened that I have a real life working experience before, let's say, starting some studies and, and moving on to other things. So in my case, behind the counter at a bank, you know, wondering how I got here. So, so that was my first job. Did, <laughs> yeah, did you get any support or was this something on top of your mind that you thought, let me just start at a bank? Um, like, really? Thinking about it, and I never reflected on that way, I think the support structure around me was really poor in, in that way. I mean, I, I was really fortunate enough to, to grow up in a stable family, in a stable environment. You know, we didn't have to flee or go to different countries or any of that. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, you, you go f happily through your teenage years, you, you finish school, and then suddenly the world collapses on you, and it's like, okay, now you have to decide what you become. Go out into <laughs> the real world. <laughs> now it's happening. Exactly, and then you have to pick a study <laughs> and decide what you do with your life. And uh, I remember I did from a German magazine called Die Zeit, uh, kind of an aptitude test that tells you what you could be doing. At that point in time, it was all uh, paper-based. And the results came back a little bit later with the mail and they basically told me that I either should become a fashion designer <laughs> or work in the uh, kind of farming industry. I have no idea how <laughs> all that, that was or based any of upon. that came back. Exactly. So I, I think I felt really lost in, in, in that moment. And I think a lot of people feel quite lost in, in, in these choices. And um, you mentioned that the world of work is changing dramatically. And that is absolutely true. But I do think that the way we look for jobs and the way we go about this journey kind of didn't change so much in the last 50 to 100 years. Yeah, it's funny, obviously this is the topic we're going to be talking yeah. about, but like to introduce you a little bit, I was actually wondering like, where did you start and how did this go about and what was your experience? And it's <laughs> funny, you're, you actually also started by, by mentioning like this whole a questionnaire that you filled out. Yeah. Um, because, um, yeah, I want to go a little bit into first, like dive into the, to the work of Skill Lab, the mm -hmm. organization that you helped um, finding, founding, so to say. Because mm -hmm. um, um, I've seen a couple of, of the interfaces and it looked to me uh, actually also a little bit like filling out some sort of questionnaire that mm -hmm. gives you an overview of your skills. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can like lead us through a little bit what it is that you guys do. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, let me first take a step back and quickly explain what Skillab is. So we're we're social business from Amsterdam. You could probably call us a technology company. Around twenty people. The majority of us work on our main tool, and that is a skill profiling tool um, that at the same time also provides career guidance and support. Um, and the way this works, if I would now invite you to the application, 
um, is that you first file all of the experiences of your life. So what are the jobs you had, the education you received, but also other things you did in your life, let's say community service or you know, uh, some charity work or taking care of your parents. Sports, hobbies. Actually, everything. Uh, every like every single kind of experience that has brought you some sort of skill, you can put into the app. Exactly, and I think it's one of these myths that you know the only valuable skills in the world are you know work or the education, the formal education received. I think we learn most of our skills actually also outside of that, but. You know, so in the app, you file those experiences relatively quickly, and then we train an artificial intelligence to essentially have an interview with you um, on what you exactly did in each experience. Um, so we differentiate amongst around 13,500 different skills. So this are all of the activities in the labor market, <laughs> and our AI is kind of trained to figure out as quickly as possible what you exactly did in each of these experiences. Um, and do that also as quickly as possible. Um, I can go deep into the technology of it, which, which is very cool, but uh, the consequence of that is that we can, for any person, regardless of their background, in over 27 different languages, figure out what are actually the things that this person knows how to do. So what is like an, an example question, for example, that the AI system uh, would ask? Uh, you know, it, it, it literally asks, you know, for example, let's take the situation where you're here in, you know, in interviews, like, have you interviewed people on camera mm. for something? Do you know how to set up camera equipment? Did you kind of sound level check uh, the, the sound <coughs> equipment and the microphones? And it kind Did of you picks us? based on the stuff you put in, what kind of questions it should then be asking. Exactly. So yeah. it, it basically asks you always, did you do this? Did you do that? And every single time you, you say, yes, I did it or I didn't do that. It adjusts its line of questioning, um, and it, you know, like it's a little bit mathematical speaking, there, it has a map in mind of one, what somebody could be doing in a job like this, as yours, um, and it wants to as quickly as possible figure out, okay, what did you do? Um, but the consequence, you know, for everyone is the same. We, so usually, somebody in their twenties that uses our tool has around seventy skills. Somebody in their thirties around one hundred thirty skills. And then we take those skills and match them into every single job around that person, um, ranging from mayor to you know train conductor. You must have stuff. such a big data set going on if you need to like actually get to all these different kinds of skills, but at the same time also <laughs> trying to map what like jobs require which kind of skills. Exactly. You know, so, so that's the geeky part that I also, you know, as a technologist, I'm really excited about. Um, but it's exactly this mapping. And I think it's very valuable because it gives you like a 360 degree career orientation um, in which you understand, okay, with all the things I know how to do, in which jobs around me are they useful? And what's more demand, what's in less demand? And when we show somebody a vacancy or a job that they could apply for, um, we also show education and training that is around the user that addresses the skill gap to that job. So how can I make myself more employable for this job? And if you like a job, you can also auto-generate uh, job application materials for that. So um, that's like a uniquely generated CV and resume that tells essentially the story of your life, of all of the skills and competencies that you acquired so far that is relevant for this job. Why do we need this? Because I'm like no. wondering right now, for example, if I were to apply for a job, mm -hmm. like I make my own CV, I check what kind of skills people are looking for, I, the whole shabam, so mm -hmm. to say. So I'm wondering what exactly uh, yeah, is, is the problem right now that we need such an, an initiative, a skill up for? So the main thing, what I overall would say that the labor market works fine for people that have the right education, the right background, and know what they want to do with their life. But the reality is that there is an ever-increasing part of our population that's more and more lost, that don't know how to move forward, that don't know which jobs they could go for or how to build for a sustainable career for themselves. And I think for all of those individuals that have to go through a transition, uh, in order to create a sustainable income for themselves. This is extremely valuable. And we started with SkillUp in 2018 with a focus on refugees and migrants, because the reality, if you migrate to Europe, is that all of your past degrees and credentials 
are pretty worthless None here. of them are valid, yeah. And you also don't understand the local labor market. You know, things are just different. But I would argue that the skills you acquired in your life so far are still highly valuable also to employers here. And so um, here the value is very obvious. How, you know, helping somebody to translate their background into skills, put that into a new context, and then help that person to get a job and also to pick the right educational choices along the way. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm wondering right now, because that, that sounds um, obviously like a like great initiative, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the people who sit on the other side that need to receive, yeah. um, for example, talking in this case about migrants who don't have any valid diplomas, but mm -hmm. are like, yeah, but I have certain kind of skills, but for loads of jobs, let's say the health sector, where we have a huge shortage of people yeah. right now, I can imagine that people come in saying like, yeah, I worked in a hospital back where I come from, but here you don't have the diploma. So how do you work around the issue of not being able to then show uh, a diploma, but do getting them into those kind of jobs? Is there something? Yeah. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. Like the first piece is, uh, there are quite a lot of protected professions. You know, there is, there's, for example, especially in medicine, you know, you cannot just decide to be a doctor or a nurse and then walk into the job and do it. Is even it though, like, hey, even if you can, you know, like you just need the right piece of paper by the right Dutch authority. We can know nothing about that. But there is a huge part of the labor market where employers are really desperate for great employees and candidates. Um, and what we just need to make sure is like really help the employer to see a candidate for what they can do, you know. And um, that's also the part of, you know, how do you then help somebody best to apply for a job? And in our experience, it is that employers still want to stick to the old format of a CV, resume, you know, that's just like it's, tr it's a very traditional industry or how that process works of, of hiring. Um, but it's about really making the best possible case for a candidate and really showing, hey, this is all of the things I learned or this person learned throughout their lives that qualify them for this job. The decision whether to hire that person is obviously still with the employer. But we think that, and that's our job in all of this, is that nobody should be kind of left behind or discriminated because their skills are invisible. Our job is to make the skills and competences of a person visible and then be the best possible advocate for them uh, so they have a fair and equal chance. Yeah, so another thing that, that I need to think about when talking about this, because it, it sounds to me like you're not so much focusing um, on the part of like this isn't possible because you don't have the right diplomas, but let's just see how we can make it possible. Yeah. And I think um, a major part of that also, for example, when, when looking at lo local context where people come in, being a newcomer, I think language plays a really big mm -hmm. uh, role in that. Yeah. How, how do you see that? So we address that in our application, um, uh, first of all, for language availability. You know, even if, let's say, uh, you, can, you can speak the local language, let's say Dutch, it's often, it takes years and having worked in a certain environment to know all of the words around a yeah. certain job. And so it's really important that you capture the information in the native language of the user. So for example, we, we support Arabic. And um, what we do with the application is that everything is automatically also translated into uh, the language of the local country. So for, for example, here's the city of Amsterdam as a client of us. And um, you know most of the users of their migrant and refugee integration program use the application if they use them at home in Arabic, but you know the application materials uh, they generate would be in Dutch. And obviously you have to be able to speak Dutch. You have to communicate That's also to the employer. Potentially then where if you say like oh you're you're missing some skills where you can redirect them to say a language course to be able to get that skill up to date. Yeah, and I think it's 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 not, you know, we can't solve the entire kind of problem space here and I think there is so much great work done um, and so many services provided. You know, our key piece here is to make sure that somebody, you know, is not invisible, that they can understand themselves on the basis of their skills, that they understand how um, they, you know, what jobs are possible and then have the best possible chance of getting them. There's a lot of pieces around it um, and, you know, it's still a huge task for any person yeah. to, to, to get into employment. So 
what I Im imagine myself right now is that mm. okay, you you've built this app, and mm -hmm. me uh, as a uh, potential, I don't know, someone who would want to fill it out, I'm doing that by myself, mm -hmm. um, and then um, I get a result yeah. uh, based on that. But it just all feels a little bit like the what we used to obviously uh, do when we coach someone towards yeah. a job or when we help them towards a job. There's also a really big social aspect of, of this. So it's not just the filling out a questionnaire and then there's something and then good luck so how how do you yeah. is, there, is there a focus on this part as well i mean that's uh you know i skipped that part a little bit at, uh, at the beginning but we never distribute the application mm -hmm. directly to job seekers so uh, as a as a social business our clients are employment and career services around the world and we work with employment career services in around 25 different countries um, and at the end of the day, at these employment career services, career counselors work there. Um, they're usually terribly overworked. Um, they have to ca take care of way too many people <laughs> and are understaffed, etc. Um, and what these organizations do is they, they essentially buy our technology and licenses. They distribute the application to the job seekers they serve. Those individuals can self-counsel already to some degree um, using the application and I think there's also a therapeutical aspect in seeing your own skills and seeing how that relates to jobs but while using the application those job seekers also create a really good data profile skill profile for the career counselor so that when you sit down with the career counselor it's so much easier for the counselor to you know understand immediately what the person can do how they relate to jobs and I certainly think that the human component in this um, kind of employment support is super critical. Um, we just think that the time should be invested on meaningful things and not on data entry. So with other words... Which is the reason why you can actually like enter it yourself and once you're actually seeing someone it's mostly about talking about what it is that the results actually portray. Precisely. Yeah. You know? And I, you know, from our experience, that's also what career counselors want to do, right? Like they want to help people. They don't want to, you know, fill out forms. I think, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's in the end also about yeah. being in touch with someone else. And especially when looking f for a job or when getting uh, advice or being helped by one of the, one of those like huge recruitment companies, so to mm -hmm. say, um, it's the, the personal touch that, that yeah. does it for yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, machine learning, mm -hmm. because you're using an artificial intelligence yeah. system, which means, uh, um, well, we've had some talks on this channel as, as well, mm -hmm. um, on the importance of putting in the right amount of data, because mm -hmm. uh, there is quite some discrimination right now yeah. uh, happening in different kinds of tools or systems that people use working in HR, uh, trying to actually redirect people to uh, the right amount of jobs in which there's, for example, a huge bias in the data. Mm -hmm. um, there's always this very famous uh, example of Amazon mm -hmm. who uh, uh, generated like a, a profile, so to say, for, for people working at uh, the high, high end mm -hmm. level. And um, the AI that they used was showing that it was mostly men, middle-aged, um, Caucasian. And then uh, the AI program automatically filtered uh, um, Afro, uh, because I think this was in America, Afro-American people. It filtered out women, like none of them. So basically a case of rubbish in, rubbish out. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work with the application that you guys have built? I mean, for, for first of all, what I would generally say is this is a super important and relevant thing. And I do absolutely think that when it comes to the employment industry, human resources, uh, career guidance, uh, this is from an AI policy perspective, an absolute high risk area. And I can talk about that a little bit more in detail. And, and I think the Amazon yeah, example Yeah, let's go to the, the, the broader one in a little bit. But first, yeah, I was indeed the, wondering how it... How yeah. we deal with it. And I think the number one... Like, let's start, the number one choice you have to take is where do you use AI and where you do not use AI. We only use AI in the skill profiling, the interview, where the user at the end of the day has the full control um, of what skills they claim and which skills they say, I, I don't have. 
meaning we use uh, essentially the AI to help somebody as quickly as possible to go through these 13,500 skills while not looking at 13,500 skills um, and figuring out what they can do. In terms of a technology perspective, it's quite similar to how, let's say, uh, your Netflix or YouTube algorithm would suggest things mm -hmm. to you based on kind of your background, what you would like. But at the end of the day, you still decide what you watch. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so. It's a, we use it in a guiding fashion. We never, ever would use it in a way to match people to something in a deterministic way. To uh, all of our matches to vacancies and education are based on traditional algorithms um, that are very transparent and very simple. Um, and you can never, I, like I'm very clear on this, like I think <laughs> a black box algorithm should never decide what a human being should do with their life. Um, and then the other part where it should never be used is in filtering. Um, because we get into this whole bias topic and you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So our use of AI and you know, we, uh, like I think we can announce it, it's official, but we can announce that uh, next week you know, our use of AI has been now selected by the UNESCO as one of the top 10 users of AI for UN sustainability development goals. That's great news. Um, is is actually trying to balance this a little bit in, in this way, you know, and it's, it's about design choices on our side. It's like, how do we build this? We're, how do we make sure that we only use it in the most ethical way? But there's another dimension on it, which I find super fascinating. In an environment where we see more and more discrimination through these algorithms, how can we kind of level the playing field? for people that uh, have a background that's easily discriminated against. Yeah, because what does that discrimination on the labor market, so to say, look like right no. now? I mean, here, here are a couple of facts. Uh, for the majority of CVs or job applications that are kind of processed when you apply, apply in the year 2022 for a job, um, in most cases, the first screening of resumes is not done by a human being. It happens by an AI pre-selection algorithm. And that, you know, that's, that's uh, in the United States, you, you move to very high percentages. Are we talking right now about like the really big kind of companies that do this kind of screening? Yeah. Or would you say it's also like the, the, like the, um, the middle sized, so to say, companies or even the smaller ones? The, like if they use an application tracking tool, yeah. then it's pretty likely. But so some piece of software to manage applications, etc., which they're most likely going to do unless it's a very small place. These things are built into these tools and you can activate them if you want to. Um, and uh, you are right, you will mostly, like, you will see the systematic use of this, especially with larger companies. Um, but um, it's, it's kind of becoming more and more of a standard. It's a pre-screening, pre-selection, pre-scoring of, uh, of, of CVs. Yeah, and I can imagine that someone working actually in HR does like a quick review of like maybe out of a pile of 100, selecting 10 to actually see whether the machine does its job. And then... Yeah, and that's where we in get In the to, best case, let's say. That's where we get to the... <laughs> yeah, exactly, to the, to the tricky part of it. And, and that is the biases. And, you know, that's, that's where we also need to clearly talk about, you know, machine learning and AI algorithms. At the end of the day, these are just statistical models that kind of highlight a little bit the nuances of how our world works. And the reality is that our work of world of work is extremely biased in many directions, right? Like, so we, there's obviously the male-female uh, balance and in, in, in especially pay. Um, you know, then there's, you know, even if we don't want this to exist, there's undeniably a racial component. Um, and uh, it's age. Age. So, so you know, uh, how many black women work in the financial industry in the Netherlands? You know, that's I wouldn't be uh, able to answer this question, but no, no, my, my no, guess would many. be, would be uh, <laughs> less than 5%. An underrepresentative <laughs> sample. Yes. That, that, is, that is for sure. And I think what happens here is that, uh, and this is where the real danger is um, in, in all of this, is if these pre-selection algorithms are trained by how these companies usually hire, mm -hmm. that's where your Amazon example comes back, right? Um, and what these algorithms just do is that they basically just we re, re systematically reapply the exact same biases they got trained with, and then they apply them on the future candidates. And that's where it gets very, very tricky and unethical, um, I find. And um, 
there's an awakening a little bit in this because there is more and more discussion around it. Yeah, and because of these kind of cases and uh, yeah, also, I mean, diversity in the workspace nowadays has become quite quite a big topic, which, which is, I mean, some something different than uh, yeah. the, the AI, but definitely it, it is a topic right now. So people are becoming more conscious of like, if we have a system yeah. like this, what is it actually, what is actually the outcome of using it? Exactly. And you know, it's, it's good that cases, for example, this Amazon example, definitely triggered a lot of waves and Amazon definitely had to change a lot of things. So now they, or they do hiring and, um, you know, I, I, but I think there's another level of discrimination that brings me a little bit back towards skills mm -hmm. is that we emphasize so much degrees and the right job titles and CVs. And, you know, when you go nowadays, for example, on LinkedIn, you know, you'll, you see all of these perfect it profiles. It emphasizes that, so to say. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's all about the signaling of, of things and, 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 and so on. But the reality, if we look at our users, around one or two percent mm -hmm. of them have LinkedIn. And I would argue that the people that use LinkedIn successfully are also not the ones that need career support. Um, I think it's also LinkedIn um, is kind of a platform that is applied by people who already have uh, so to say a lot of social capital yeah. so you're able to create these kind of links on LinkedIn just because I mean you have connections or you have a great education yeah. or you're already so to say on, on top of the, the food pyramid in, 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 in a job world you're right you're absolutely right. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge how these networks and the focus on degrees and titles it creates barriers of entry for so many people in our society. And I don't want to be unfair about LinkedIn. LinkedIn does now a lot more to recognize skills. They offer a lot on the education side. So LinkedIn is not the problem here. But I do think what we see in our society is that there is a strong focus on degrees and titles. And what we try to do is to bring it down to this skill level. Yeah, and not, so to say, just on degrees and, and titles, but also on, um, let's, let's say, the, the level of education that you have been enjoying, yeah. um, which is why uh, in the Netherlands, but I'm sure that this is like a trend in a lot of Western countries, um, we have this urge for uh, our children to go to schools where they yeah. can gain uh, a lot of knowledge like aiming for university basically that's what many people do so high educated people like the the amount of them within mm -hmm. our country is going to increase it's going to grow and grow and grow and even though we uh we we, have, we are a services country so to say so we need a lot of jobs in this this is also um posting us like giving us like a, a problem so to say because mm -hmm. what we see right now is that jobs that traditionally um, require not a university kind of level yeah. like in healthcare or let's say plumbing or these kind of things there's there's so little people actually yeah. being able to, to study this or they are able to study it but they're not doing it because they feel like this is a low it, like even the classification yeah. lower education and higher education yeah i it's so true and the irony of all of this is that if you received a vocational education instead of an academic education your income on average is going to be higher than with the academic education because there's such a demand Shortage. it's demand and supply exactly so there's such a demand of people that you know can actually do something <laughs> instead of you know just talk. in an abstract <laughs> level talk you know talk, sit at a table let's say. yeah um, <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, I think it stems from the same thing. You're right. It's, 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 it's a little bit the obsession with degrees, prestige. It has to be this university name. It has to have this complicated title. If you look also now at companies, how, you know, organizational titles are completely blown up. Why is that the case? Because, you know, it, it needs to look more To look important interesting and important. on LinkedIn. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, to, 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 to signal somehow that this is an interesting kind of, that, that this person is very important. But it's, at the end of the day, it's just an inflation in titles. It sounds, indeed, like the way you're putting it right now, it sounds quite empty. Yeah. And I do think we will come back, and you see that a lot in the language, to this, to the, to just focus on skills and competencies and you know really acquiring what can you do exactly and yeah. within that very importantly what are your transversal 
competencies and skills. What you are need the to explain that. I have never heard of this transversal com competences. The competencies. These are mm -hmm. the skills that are almost um, relevant for any job you want to do in your environment. Like soft skills are really social skills. Social skills, soft skills. You know, being able to handle yourself. You know, interact with other people in a really good and meaningful way. And <coughs> um, you know that. That is nothing that was taught to me at university, and it shouldn't probably be taught to me at university, but I do think in the reality of a society in the labor market, these like core competencies that are relevant <laughs> for every job out there are super important. And I think digital skills um, are a huge aspect of this, and I think Europe has huge ambitions around this. They need to. Um, and why, why do they need to? The world of work is becoming more and more digital. And if you're not able to make sure that your population, your citizens, have the digital skills, you run into the risk that an increasing part of your population is just left behind. And we're not talking right now about all the people above 60, 70 who cannot do their banking anymore because they, they lack skills. But this is also already starting in different generations. Exactly. Like younger yeah. than that. Yeah. And I think the requirements also of what is expected, you know, uh, from you right now, you know, if you can read emails and put together a PowerPoint presentation and write in Microsoft Word, that's, I mean, that's quite. That's already probably, you know, not everybody can do that, but that, you know, is a baseline. But I do think as we move more and more into the future, the requirements for uh, these digital skills will also increase. I mean, predicting is always a tricky and uh, a tricky kind of thing. Yeah. But what do you think will be these skills? We're always having this discussion about. 21st century skills, about yeah. people being ready for the 21st century, whatever that may mean. So I'm, I'm wondering, like looking, you're probably, or I'm, I'm assuming right now, maybe seeing patterns in the data of the skills, what you already mentioned, like the soft skills that are so, are going to be so important. But what else do you see right now that you feel like, okay, in the future, these skills are going to be of utmost importance? Yeah, I think there, there's a very, focused field of study on exactly this question and I think it always comes back to like some core essential soft skills um, you know probably a certain set of digital skills and then it's all within your specialization you know what are you actually doing you know uh, the question is depends yeah and I think that's that's totally <laughs> fair right uh -huh. like I uh, I I, for, like, I always find it amazing how, how much training if you let's say work in, in, in a certain craft you know, how many years of training and practice you need to actually be good at something, you know? Um, and I do think that it's really important for people to, to have a sustainable income for themselves and a sustainable jobs to, to really build a, you know, a career where they really know how to do something, you know? And it doesn't need to be fixing a car or being a plumber or being a hairdresser, but like to have an actual core set of competences and skills that are really useful for other people around you and society, I think that is really important as well. So um, we cannot all be generalists, you know, we cannot all be managers and politicians and, and so on. You know, it's, uh, it's really important for yourself that you learn a specialization or the ability to do a very specific thing very well. Yeah. So, um I mean, you just talked a little bit about the uh, municipality of Amsterdam mm -hmm. actually uh, um, using your application right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just in Western countries, so to say, that yeah. people are using your application at the moment. Because you just mentioned that you are active in right now over 20 something. 25 countries. 25 yeah. countries. Yeah. Um, telling me that also uh, countries in Northern Africa, where actually yeah. first you started working uh, with refugees here in the Netherlands, but now also um, going to countries where they actually came from. Mm -hmm. um, how did that happen? And also, <laughs> um, do you face the same kind of issues in a uh, labor market, so to say, as we see over here? To a more extreme degree, I would say. Like I. I, I think, you know, uh, so, so, so how did this happen was, was, mm -hmm. was very much that we in Europe focused at the beginning on refugees and migrants to a large degree. And um, through that, it became necessary that our application works for them. And it also works in all of these different languages. 
and from there on it was a relatively small leap to you know just go also to all other places in the world and say hey this is also useful in this context you know and um, if it's Iraq or you know Jordan Palestine all the northern African countries um, so this uh, this is how it kind of came together um, in terms of what is the situation they face uh, we now went through this massive shock with COVID, you know, for where the Western world essentially went into a lockdown because it could. You know, we mostly work on laptops nowadays here in, in Western European countries, and we're trying to figure out how to move out of this. But obviously, this causes massive turbulence in every country, in every labor market out there. And uh, you see this huge struggle that you have a huge part of the population. I'd say that, uh, like, Microsoft Teams and having mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. meetings is now also definitely one of the skills people need. Yeah, I mean, if you, <laughs> so like, to say. If you didn't figure out how to use <laughs> <laughs> an online meeting uh, in the last two, <laughs> two years, but it's uh, what, what, what we see, and it's a huge issue, is that so many countries have very young populations, um, not just on the African continent, but um, also all over Asia, and all of these people want to work. You know, all of these people want to create a living for themselves. They want to build themselves a life. And yes, there is a lot of economic opportunities and jobs are created, etc. But it's a huge challenge to, to navigate this. So we work a lot also with partners. For example, the International Labour Organization um, is a client and connects us with many partners that provide career guidance and support, especially to young people um, that are in an environment where there's no infrastructure to help them and where it's really, you, you're not taken care of, right? Like you really have to figure out yourself how you get yourself a job and then slowly but surely build yourself a career that kind of can sustain you for 40 years in your family. And um, I, again, you know, those, and especially those environments, this focus on skills and competencies and building competencies in young people, uh, and thinking about jobs in terms of skill requirements is uh, as relevant there as it's here, <laughs> probably even more. I can, uh, I can totally imagine. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the, the black box, yeah. uh, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the different kinds of systems are using, looking different settings, but I can imagine there might be something else considering this this topic of moving into the labor market yeah. that you might want to address that we haven't addressed yet. So basically, this is an open question of me to you. Yeah. So th <laughs> I uh, thank you. You know, like obviously a lot of things keep us busy. Um, one thing we find super fascinating right now is the transition towards a green economy mm -hmm. and how to make that a just transition. Um, and we, together with the UN high-level champions for climate action. So that's basically the people that organized the COP conference, uh, partially, um, launched an uh, initiative uh, together with them and a couple of other actors where we specifically look at how can we support the workforce in industries that is in declining jobs. Because this is going to be a big thing, obviously, the coming couple of yeah. years. We have the whole, well, we need to transform our economy, so to say, so jobs the way in which we knew them. You also refer to, like, let's say, the, the brown economy, yeah. which is based on uh, coals and uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We're going to transform that into a more sustainable uh, yeah. uh, industry-based uh, uh, work field. And that's going to require different skills. Yeah, and that's where, you know, you have to put your... That that's where it gets also very difficult and tricky, right? Like, because of, let's say if you think about coal and mining and certain energy sources, these are not evenly distributed jobs. These are highly regionally concentrated jobs at you know this one spot where there is a coal mine. And um, what now is happening in the labor market and needs to happen over the next kind of uh, years and decades is that we need to essentially remove these jobs very abruptly, very drastically, and this is going to be a disaster. In that sense, enable to be able to to take care of our environment the right way. Exactly to yeah. to achieve our mission goals um, yeah. and the reduction of those, and um, like a very good example of this is that you know I think in the next years we globally need to uh, uh, remove around four hundred fifty thousand jobs in, in 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 coal. In parallel, I think something over four million jobs are going to be generated in solar, 
which sounds like a really good you know, trade-off. That's a lot more jobs we're going to create than we're going to remove. But the reality is that the coal jobs are just all at one spot, and while the solar jobs are more distributed and at all kinds of different places. So um, I think the challenge we face here is that we really need to take care of the communities that are very negatively affected uh, by this transition and then make it just. And the way we do this with our approach is by fully understanding their skill sets. Because communities negatively uh, being affected by this, do you mean then that communities like need to, that people need to move because of these other jobs, which is going to, to rip apart different kinds of uh, uh, communities? That yeah, and you, can, you cannot just expect from somebody to just move uh, across, you know, to, to different place. I mean, if you, if you take, let's say, let's take a community of, you know, this is, this is a very, without calling out names is, uh, or places, this is a pretty common example of, let's say, um, area, 60, 70,000 people live there. Uh, you know, 5,000 of those jobs are in the coal industry or in a specific mining industry. Now that is supposed to not exist anymore in a very abrupt way, yeah. which means basically a third of the families in that area so need to lose their income. Yeah. And um, that's obviously a disaster. Then you hope shock. something local in that sense turns up where they can redirect, but it's very well possible that non, not all of them want to work there. So it means moving maybe different states, maybe different. And, and I think we have also a social them, obligation yeah. to take care of those individuals. And um, there are, for example, in Europe, the massive funds available and ready to make this transition just. That's also, you know, a just transition, that's all, uh, always what it's referred to. And that means we need to make sure that in those areas, the right industries are attracted. So that's the right reskilling and training for those individuals is provided so they can actually move into jobs where... Uh, and then we can have a whole, whole new discussion about what is actually right also for the area. Because you're saying like the right industry is the right, that, that's a whole and, other and, thing. And that's based on the skill set that's available. Yeah. Because I think that one thing that people often forget is like when people think about the mining industry, they probably have a mental image from, you know, 50 to 100 years what ago. What it looks like, yeah. But these are actually like quite high extremely skills. high paid, uh, like some of the highest paid jobs <laughs> in industries, very high tech, uh, very highly skilled in every regard, right? And that is, that is extremely useful uh, kind of like, that's just for any, for other industries also an extremely useful skill set. But we need to be good identifying the skill sets of those communities and then be much more targeted in kind of either helping people to transition to available jobs and if there is no available jobs, to think about the question, okay, what kind of jobs would really benefit from the skill set and which industry should come here? So this will be like the next stage for Skill Lab after helping perhaps municipalities, different countries to actually look at this transition yeah. and to see what your role will be there. So, so we're working, you know, we're starting to work now and uh, uh, moving towards working a couple of global projects on this, um, because this is obviously something that is globally happening. Uh, so this is super interesting and relevant, and I think it's just at the beginning of something that's going to keep us very busy for a couple of decades, as not Skelet, but as you know, overall society, uh, the transition towards a carbon neutral economy. And the other thing, the other part of the equation that we're also very focused there is that we want to create these green industries, we want to create these green jobs, but then these jobs also need to be filled with people that have been educated and trained in the right way. So what we also do is we look at the requirements of green jobs, understand exactly what's the skill set that's required. We look at the educational landscape that prepares people and basically provide very clear recommendations on, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to create, it's one thing to create 6,000 jobs, mm -hmm. let's say in a certain area around, let's say offshore wind energy, but what are the skills these people need to have and what, you know, what is already there in, in kind of workforce? How does it need to be retrained? Um, it's and again, the other part of the, the, the app, so to say, that you guys yeah. uh, have been creating and the whole, the amount, fast amount of data that you're yeah. needing to actually see what is it like from the, 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 the pool factor, so to say, yeah. with which we get people in. Thank you, Ulrich, for this uh, conversation. I'm excited to pleasure. see uh, what jobs the future will bring us. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Absolute pleasure being here and, and thank you so much. Beste kijker, vond je dit ook een interessante uitzending? Vergeet dan niet je te abonneren op De Nieuwe Wereld. Leuk dat je keek en tot de volgende keer.